Hello again, here we are back for part two of the lecture on the gastrointestinal tract or the digestive system. In the first video, we talked about the functions of this system and we talked about the organs of the digestive tract, which as you know, uh, the digestive tract is the organs that food passes through on their way through your body. We talked about them each and we discussed the basic structure and function. We talked about the oral cavity, the pharynx, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, and the anus. So we're going to pick up where we left off and finish this chapter. And our first topic to finishing this chapter is to discuss the accessory organs. You may recall, these are the organs that sit outside of the GI tract which means that food does not directly pass through them. But that doesn't mean that they're any less important. So we're going to be discussing three accessory organs, the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. And their function overall is to produce and release enzymes. You remember those enzymes? Of course you do. In order to could perform chemical digestion, which is to break down foods using chemicals. We need chemicals, and those chemicals are enzymes. So here we're going to talk about where most of those enzymes are produced and stored. Okay. Let's start with the pancreas. The pancreas, in terms of its location, it's an interesting organ. It sits behind the stomach. And we can see portions of it. And here it is in kind of a yellowish color. So we can see little portions of it. But as you can see below, it's actually kind of a oblong organ. To be honest with you, it reminds me a little bit of Long Island because of its shape. And then it has this duct going right down the middle, kind of like the LIE or Long Island Expressway. Okay, so it sits behind the stomach. Let's talk about its function. This is a unique organ. It has a digestive function and an endocrine function. The endocrine function you actually may be familiar with already because the pancreas functions as a gland, which means that it secretes hormones. So indeed, the pancreas produces insulin and glucagon, which are hormones. So I'd like you to know that, okay? So the pancreas has a function that's considered to be part of the endocrine system where it produces hormones, specifically the hormones insulin and glucagon. And these hormones, of course, relate to the digestive system because these are the hormones that play a role in blood sugar regulation. Okay, but we're also, because this is the digestive chapter, we're more focused about the digestive system. So the digestive function of the pancreas is to produce and secrete enzymes that are needed for chemical digestion. Pretty cool. Now, I wanna go back to this page because I wanna point out something. I wonder if I can erase it even after I move the page. Oh, I can. That's some high tech stuff right there. I wanna point out that, as you remember, these are accessory organs. So the pancreas, what that means is food does not pass through it. Food is going to go through the stomach and it's going to go from the stomach into the small intestine. All the while, the pancreas is behind the stomach, so food does not directly pass through it. However, we need a way to get these digestive enzymes from the pancreas into the digestive tract. So that's why you can see here, the pancreas, it will release all the enzymes it produces back into the small intestine. So all the enzymes that are produced in the pancreas catch a ride on this duct that I called the Long Island Expressway. And that duct will 
empty into the small intestine. That's a really important point. So even though the pancreas sits outside the digestive tract, we absolutely have to have a way to get those enzymes into the digestive tract. And that little duct traveling down the center of the pancreas empties directly into the small intestine. And for bonus points, who's, who's imagining this in their head? I'm lying about the bonus points, but there is the joy of learning. This is why the small intestine can now do chemical digestion because now it has all of the enzymes it needs. Up until this point, remember, we can only chemically digest starch in the mouth. We can only chemically digest some protein in the stomach. But we really can't do most of the chemical digestion until we get to the small intestine. Why? Because now we will have the enzymes needed to do that coming in from the pancreas. Good stuff, isn't it? All right. Let's talk about the liver. The liver, big, huge organ in the upper right quadrant. There it is. Food does not directly pass through it. It technically has four lobes. You do not have to know that. There's a picture down below of what the liver looks like up close. It's kind of cool. And I only appointed this, I only included this picture because I wanted you to see how vascular the liver is. Of course, one of the liver's jobs is to filter blood. So it has to be, we have all these blood vessels in the corners here. There's some there too. And then we have these veins leading into a central vein. So my point is the liver is very vascular, which helps in its function to filter blood. Let's talk about those functions. It's almost like I planned that, isn't it? One of the functions of the liver is to filter the blood. It filters out alcohol and other toxins. The digestive, specifically, the digestive function of the liver is to produce bile. So we know that we need enzymes to do chemical digestion of nutrients, and we get a lot of those enzymes from the pancreas. But when it comes to dietary fats, remember fats, can, fats take longer to digest and absorb because there's more steps involved. And here is another example. In addition to digestive enzymes needed to break down fats, we also need something called bile. Bile is a substance that helps to emulsify or break down the fats. Don't get uh, thrown off by the fancy terminology. Emulsify, in this case, is just a fancy way of saying breakdown. So the liver produces bile, which helps to break down fats chemically. And the last function I have it listed here as something called metabolic regulation because I'm not sure what to call it, but I'll tell you what the important points are. These two bullets right here. So let's think about this, okay? All the blood from the small intestine, remember SI is just a shorthand way to say small intestine. We know that the small intestine is where we absorb nutrients. And we remember that absorb means to move these nutrients into the bloodstream. Okay, let me go back for a second. So we know that it is in the small intestine that we do absorption. So we absorb nutrients from the small intestine into the surrounding bloodstream. And what I'm saying here is all that nutrient-rich blood from the small intestine, all of it immediately goes to the liver. So after nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine into the bloodstream, okay, that nutrient-rich blood travels to the liver. Always, always, always. The nutrient-rich blood from the small intestine, where we just absorb nutrients from, that nutrient-rich blood 
goes to the liver. And the liver has a very important job. The liver is going to keep some of those nutrients in the bloodstream, but it's also going to tell the body to store some nutrients. So when the liver receives all of that nutrient-rich blood from the small intestine, the liver will decide how many of those nutrients to store and how many of those nutrients to stay in the bloodstream. Really important job. And it makes sense. If you think about it, you eat a big meal, you eat anything really. If you eat a big meal, you don't need all those nutrients from that big meal in your bloodstream right away. You don't need, if you have a bagel for breakfast and then some orange juice, you don't need all that sugar in your bloodstream right away. So the idea is once all those nutrients from your food are digested and absorbed, the liver, the liver decides, okay, we're going to keep some sugar in the bloodstream because we want to keep our blood sugar at an appropriate level. But we don't need to overload the bloodstream with sugar. So we keep some sugar in the bloodstream, but we store the rest away for later. And what this also means is if you haven't eaten for a couple of hours, it's no biggie. Because if you haven't eaten for a couple of hours and your blood sugar goes down, well, then your liver can just release some of its stored sugar from before. So it is a well-designed system. Yeah, the liver is pretty cool. I think a lot of people just think about, oh, it filters blood. And we forget about its many other important functions. Okay, um, the gallbladder we're going to go through really quickly. The gallbladder is a little green guy or gal that sits on the bottom of the liver. And its job is to store bile. Stores bile. So we oftentimes have a little excess, or if we have some extra from the liver, uh, the gallbladder functions as a little storage tank. That's my cat knocking over things next to me. I don't know what she's doing. All right, so the, the gallbladder located on the underside bottom of the liver, and it stores bile. Okay, I'm going to try and keep things as simple as we can. All right, so some important take-home points about the accessory glands. We know that most of these accessory glands function to produce enzymes and bile, which are both needed for chemical digestion. We would not, we wouldn't be able to, to chemically digest our foods without it. And everything, I know that I mentioned the duct coming from the pancreas emptying into the small intestine. Well, guess what? There's also ducts coming down from the liver and ducts coming down from the gallbladder. And where do those ducts empty into? The small intestine. So if the job of the liver, the liver is here, but they've taken it out just so you can better see the gallbladder. The liver produces bile and the gallbladder stores bile. Well, whenever we need it, it is released through these ducts and emptied into the small intestine. So now these needed enzymes are in the small intestine, so the small intestine can do the rest of its job, which is to chemically digest all nutrients. Okay. Now, here's some extra information. This is not going to be on the test, but it's interesting. Um, if you think about our intestinal juices, and I kind of love how they just make it so simple, intestinal juices. Our digestive system produces quite a lot. We need a lot of enzymes. We need a lot of hydrochloric acid. We need a lot of saliva. So you can see we produce 6.7 liters of digestive juices each day. That's a lot. Think about those two liter bottles of soda or seltzer or something. Two, four, six. Over three of those uh, produced and secreted by our digestive organs. 
Okay, this is also extra, won't be on the test. It gives you an idea about how long food items spend in each part of the digestive tract. I did mention that it was very short, getting from the mouth to the stomach. It gets a little bit longer as we go down. And uh, whatever is left after we absorb nutrients in the small intestine, uh, that the process of moving, moving things through the large intestine is very slow. And that's, of course, so we can reabsorb as much water as possible. Okay. Uh, here is a summary table if you choose to use it. For each of these digestive organs, be able to give the basic structure we talked about and the basic function. All right. Let's get into some sports stuff. Finally, right? Finally. Okay. We're going to go through carbohydrates, fat, and protein. A lot of this we've already talked about, but check it out. I'm going to circle what you need to review. So what are some of the unique things about digestion and absorption of carbohydrates? Well, something that was unique is that we're able to begin chemical digestion of starch in the mouth. As a matter of fact, I would like you to know the name of one enzyme. So amylase is the enzyme needed to chemically break down starch. These enzymes are specific, which is to say that amylase can only help to chemically break down starch. Okay, there's other examples. Protease can only help to break, chemically break down protein. Lipase can only help to chemically break down fat. But just so I'll give you an example of one enzyme to know, amylase enzyme that helps to chemically break down starch. As an aside, most enzymes add in the suffix ACE. Um, amylase, protease, lipase would be some examples. That's it. The rest here we already talked about. Something, some other things that are unique about carbohydrates, they are the fastest to be digested and absorbed. The structure of carbohydrates being what they are allows the body to relatively quickly digest and absorb them. That means we understand now why carbohydrates are our first energy source. Carbohydrates are our first energy source because we can break down and absorb them the fastest. Now, we're going to be talking about this more later, but I want to make a point here. What kind of athlete would need to bring in carbohydrates during activity? Obviously, their pregame meal, they want to include carbohydrates. Obviously, after they're done their competition, they want to replenish their carbohydrates. But what about during? Well, really, the rule of thumb is about 60 minutes. If you are exercising continuously for 60 minutes or more, then you should be thinking about ingesting carbohydrates during activity. Period. That's it. Okay, this is science. We know it to be true. Anything under 60 minutes, your body has enough glucose and glycogen stores. So it would really, even though it might taste good to bring in some Gatorade, Gatorade contains sugar, glucose. Even though it might taste good to bring in glucose during a 20-minute run, your body physiologically does not need it. So actually, what might be happening is that when you bring in that Gatorade during a 20-minute run, you're taking energy away from your muscles to break down this Gatorade. And that could be actually detrimental. Now, of course, this assumes that the person is fueling properly in their diet and hydration all throughout the day. So if you have enough carbohydrate ingestion during the day, if that activity is less than 60 minutes in continuous duration, you don't need to bring carbohydrates in during activity. But over 60 minutes, we do recommend bringing in some carbohydrate. And we'll talk about that more in the carbohydrate chapter. Okay. What are some unique things about digestion and absorption of our dietary fats? 
Well, we know that digesting and absorbing fats takes longer. This is a longer process than it is for carbohydrates. What are some of the specifics? One thing that is unique is that we need bile. This is something unique to fats. In addition to some digestive enzymes, in order to chemically break down fat, we also need bile. And eventually, one of the last unique things that we already talked about was that when we absorb, when we absorb fats into the bloodstream through the small intestine wall, these fats get absorbed first into the lacteals, those green little things. This is different from carbohydrates and protein, which get absorbed through the small intestine wall directly into the bloodstream. Dietary fats get absorbed into the lacteals. It's an added step. Now, the lacteals will eventually lead these fats to the bloodstream. But it's an added step. And this is why, one reason why, fats take longer to digest and absorb. So as we said, fats, it's a more complex process than carbohydrates. Therefore, it takes longer. We need bile. Even though the process of digesting and absorbing fats is slower than carbohydrates, we may remember once we metabolize fats for energy, fats give us the most energy per gram. These are numbers that I'm going to keep giving you over and over again, which means that you definitely need to know them. For every one gram of fat that we digest, absorb, and metabolize, we can produce from that nine kilocalories of energy. That's different from the carbohydrates and the protein. Even though we don't use protein as much, we still can. These are both going to yield about four kilocalories of energy. Good. Um, we'll talk about this more later in terms of what type of athlete would need to ingest fat during. Um, probably we're talking about exercises that are three or four hours plus. So most athletes that you come across do not need physiologically fat to be ingested during activity. Okay, what are some things that are unique to protein? Protein also takes longer to digest and absorb compared to carbohydrates. We can begin chemical digestion of protein in the stomach. That is unique. The rest here is everything else that we've already talked about. So we'll keep it short at that. These two unique things takes longer to digest and absorb than carbohydrates. And we can begin some chemical digestion of protein in the stomach. Takes longer. And remember, we don't, meta we don't metabolize much protein for energy. Okay? We rely 85% of our energy f to our muscles during exercise is going to come from carbs and fat. We don't want to burn a whole lot of protein for energy. Again, we'll talk about this more later. Maybe in an ultimate endurance event. Well, I guess, I mean, it's really hard to say because we're all different. Maybe three to four hours plus. So if you're an athlete that's exercising continuously, meaning like a triathlete doing a half Ironman or full Ironman or an ultra runner, um, only those are the kind of athletes that would need to consider bringing in protein during activity. All right, now I wanna bring a couple quick points. Don't be intimidated. Here are some unique things about vitamins and minerals, which are our micronutrients. We don't need them in as much amount through our diet, but they're still very important. Something that is unique about vitamins, they don't need to be digested or broken down. So when you drink that orange juice and it has the vitamin C in it, it can be absorbed very quickly because it doesn't have to be digested. Um, something unique about minerals, I'm gonna write it down here to make it simpler. 
some minerals are absorbed into bloodstream, others aren't. So we'll talk about this more when we get to our micronutrients chapter, but something that's unique about minerals, there are some minerals that we do want to absorb into the bloodstream, but there's other minerals that we don't. These minerals that we don't absorb can still carry out a function in the body, even if they're not absorbed into the bloodstream. All the rest there is extra. In terms of water, we talked about the fact that water is absorbed mostly in the large intestine. Oh, hold on. Absorption occurs in the large intestine. Excuse me. What I didn't talk about is that we also do some absorption in the small intestine. Don't worry about the percentage here. But we talked about the primary function of the large intestine is to reabsorb water. And now I'm just adding that the small intestine can also reabsorb some water in addition to reabsorbing fats, carbs, and protein. And of course, the amount of water that we absorb is constantly changing, okay? So this, this can, I'm sure you can make sense of this. If your body is dehydrated, then your body is going to absorb more water because the cells are crying out for water because they're dehydrated. If you are adequately hydrated, if your cells are nice and plump and full of water, then we don't need to absorb as much water in the small and large intestine. So the amount of water that we absorb is very dependent upon uh, many, many situations. All right. Okay. Now, when we get to the topic of sports nutrition, there's a couple of things that are a little bit science-y, but are really important. And one of those things is something called osmolarity. And I'm bringing this up because this is a big issue when it comes to sports drinks. When sports drinks are developed, it's very important that they're developed properly so that the sugar in them and the electrolytes, potassium and sodium, among others, it's important that we can develop the sports drink so that it has the right amount of electrolytes and sugar so it can be absorbed best. And one of the biggest ways that we determine that is through something called osmolarity. I'm going to talk about osmolarity more. Here's a, here's a table of some of the common osmolarities of sports drinks. So Gatorade is a common one, Powerade. They tend to be somewhere between 200 to 300. And you know what? That's where we want it. Because what we've learned, and I'm going to define osmolarity, so don't you worry. You're not going to get off scot-free, though. What we've learned is we get best absorption at this certain osmolarity level. You can see Gatorade's a bit higher, uh, and that's okay. It's not that much higher with this unit. The unit is milliosmoles per liter. But the reason why we care about this is that we want to maximize our absorption during activity. And this is the best osmolarity. So you should know this number, about the best range for osmolarity is between about 200 to 300. You can see that Coca-Cola is much higher. Um, so Coca-Cola would not be a great drink to drink during activity. All right, so we got to define this. Okay. Now, if you look in a science textbook, a chemistry textbook, for example, there's many ways to define osmolarity. You may hear it called osmolality with an L. I'm going to give you a way that is pretty simple and that suits our purposes so we can understand it enough for our purpose. Osmolarity is the 
amount of solutes in a solution. A couple of things here. Well, actually, I think this might be best explained through an example. So let's do it. Let's use Kool-Aid. Everyone knows about Kool-Aid. So here's one of our Kool-Aids. And then we're going to have another example of a Kool-Aid. All right. Kool-Aid is made up of two ingredients. You know what they are. Two ingredients. We have the sugar, the sugar powder, and we have water. In chemical terms, in chemistry terms, the sugar is the solute because it's what's present in smallest amounts, and water is the solvent because it's present in higher amounts. When you add a solute to a solvent, you get a solution. So when we're talking about osmolarity, it is the concentration of the solute. And we define the solute as what's present in smaller amounts. If we were to compare the amount of sugar to water in a Kool-Aid, what is there more of? Well, it's mostly water, but there's less sugar. So because that's what there's less of, we're going to consider the sugar to be the solute. So the osmolarity simply refers to the concentration of the solute. Okay, here we go. Let me change colors here. What, what about, we'll make green. So in Kool-Aid A, we're going to have 10 particles of sugar. Right, so we're gonna have 10 particles of sugar and the rest is gonna be water. So it's 10% sugar. We're gonna consider this to be a pretty low osmolarity solution because it has a low amount of solute. If you don't add much sugar to Kool-Aid, what is it going to taste like? This is going to taste watery. Let's go to example B. Maybe I'll use purple. Let's say in example B, I'm adding 40 sugar particles. 8, 9, 10. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. Wow, that's a lot of sugar. I should have picked a smaller amount of sugar. <laughs> and the rest, of course, is water. So this Kool-Aid is 40% sugar. So if we add more sugar, what is it going to taste like? Instead of being watery, it's gonna taste very sweet. And in this case, we're gonna consider this to be a high osmolarity solution because it has more solute. I really do believe Kool-Aid is the best example to help understand osmolarity. Osmolarity is the concentration of the solute or the concentration of the sugar. A low osmolarity Kool-Aid is going to taste watery because there's not as much sugar. It's got a lower concentration of the solute. Whereas a higher osmolarity Kool-Aid is going to taste very sweet because it has much, much more sugar. And actually, we could say the same thing about Gatorade, couldn't we? I mean, a lot of you know that big sports teams, they'll just get the, the Gatorade powder and you'll make your own Gatorade in, in the big cooler. Well, you could choose to make the Gatorade whatever osmolarity you want. I'm telling you, the osmolarity that you want is a, between about 200 and 300. And do you think that the Gatorade on the market has the proper osmolarity? It does. 
So you should not make it any sweeter than the gate that comes out of the bottle. Now, purposely, I like to dilute my Gatorade a little bit, uh, especially for a long bike ride of three or four hours. It would just be way too much sugar for me to handle because I know my stomach. So it's variable. So I dilute mine actually about by half. Um, do we want sports drinks to have a low or high? It should be in the middle. We don't want, we don't want the sports drinks to have too high osmolarity. We don't want it to be too low. But the gold standard is somewhere between 200 and 300. Studies have shown that that's what maximizes the absorptive rate in the small intestine. If you make it too high in osmolarity, we cannot digest it as much. All right. I love science, folks. Okay. Now, <laughs> when it comes to sports, this is no surprise if you're an athlete out there. We have to talk about what we should be ingesting in terms of food and drink. But we also have to consider how that's going to sit in our stomach while we're out there exercising. Perhaps you've had an experience where you didn't eat at the right time or didn't eat the right thing before an event. And then you ended up in the porta potty or you ended up not feeling too well with cramps or with um, like fluid jiggling around in your stomach. So this is a very important topic for athletes. So how does our body, we're going to talk about it from our body's perspective first. How does our body regulate movement of things through our GI tract? Because that's really what we're talking about with gastric emptying. Of course, we tend to think of the emptying at the rectum and anus. But there's also movement or emptying of food stuff and fluid from one digestive organ to another. Well, we already know sphincters those thickenings of muscle in the walls of our digestive organs, they can contract and relax to either not let things through or let things through. And of course, the brain is what controls when they open and close, and it's involuntary. So the brain plays a part, but also hormones. And this is going to be I mean, to be honest with you, if we look at any organ in the body or pretty much any physiological process, it will be regulated by the nervous system through nerve impulses and through hormones. You can see an example here of how, how the nervous system regulates opening and closing of the sphincters. Uh, I'm not going to ask you this specifically, but it's just an example. Um, so when we eat and the food fills our stomach there are stretch receptors in the walls of the stomach. So when we eat and the stomach fills, there's going to be more stretch to the stomach, and those stretch receptors will notice, hey, there's more stretch. And those stretch receptors are connected to a nerve impulse, a neuron, which will send a nerve impulse to your brain, and then your brain will decipher that information, send a nerve impulse back out, in this case, to release sphincters to allow some of that food to go to the small intestine. And then I give you a second example of how hormones, um, an easy example would be like the Pavlov dog. There could be a sound or a sight. Um, and even at that sound or sight alone, you will start to salivate because hormones are released that are helping to get your body ready for that food you're about to ingest. All right, now here are the more practical applications. And we're almost done with this chapter. Stick with me. So when we consider putting together a diet plan for an athlete, or even you as an athlete, you can now think about, think about what you eat before, during, and after activity, when you eat it, what's your timing. Because we can, now that we are learning about the digestive system, we can learn about how to better plan our meals, their composition, and their timing to maximize absorptive rates and to reduce the incidence of discomfort and side effects. Now, what's going to affect gastric movement? Well, the more that you eat or drink, the more things are going to move through. 
that is just a general relationship. It can be a good thing if you are properly hydrated. That means that things are going to be moving through your GI tract perfectly. If you're not hydrated enough, things are going to be moving more slowly through your digestive tract, which can cause some problems, some bloating, for example. Or if you're overhydrated, maybe things are moving too quickly through your digestive tract and you're not giving your small intestine enough time to absorb the nutrients that it needs. What about exercise intensity? The rate of gastric emptying is not affected by exercise intensity that is lower than 80% of your max, your aerobic max. So to be honest with you, the specific rate of how things move through is not significantly affected by activity unless you're exercising at 80% plus of your max. And that's a really high intensity, folks. But there's other things to consider. Gastric emptying is actually slowed when we do intermittent high-intensity bouts. And this is something that we see in a lot of activities. Think about team sports like soccer or football. You may be exercising at a much lower intensity for the majority of time, but when the ball comes your way, your exercise intensity goes up. So during these intermittent, repeated, high-intensity bouts, gastric emptying is actually slowed. That isn't necessarily a problem because it means that more energy is going away from your digestive tract to your muscles to help you actually do that high-intensity activity. But it just means we need to be careful. If you eat too much or drink too much right before activity, your gastric emptying is probably going to be slowed. So you can't expect it to be digested and absorbed or metabolized as quickly. So that's a consideration. And of course, gastric emptying will change under different conditions. So a lot of this is influenced by hydration, um, temperature, environment. Because if, if it's a really hot or humid environment, we're going to be sweating. We're going to be losing some fluid from our digestive tract, which will even slow down gastric emptying even more. Later when we go through each nutrient, we'll talk about this again. Um, but now we're just giving you the foundations. Okay, osmolarity. We already talked about this. What is the ideal? About 200 to 300. As you can see from the bullet point above that, you can probably, 400 is just fine too. This just gives us a ballpark. But if it's too high... If our osmolarity is too high, if there's too much solute, it will lower gastric emptying. That's not good. Um, of course, what type of nutrient we absorb can affect our gastric emptying. Carbs are the fastest. Fats are the slowest. And then, of course, stress. Not just the physical stress of exercise, but the psychological stress. So if you are, if it's a big playoff game and you are even more psychologically stressed than normal, anytime we add any additional psychological stress, it will reduce gastric emptying even more. So you gotta be careful about how much food and drink you're bringing in. Okay, so how do we avoid GI distress during exercise? If you wanna see a video of what happens if you mess this up, look at Julie Moss. I think it was 1982. Oh, I think it was 1982 Iron Man. Let's go to YouTube, put Julie Moss Iron Man. I think it was 82 or something. She's completely dehydrated, um, really to the max. And uh, it's kind of hard to watch, but you will see the body, when it gets to that extreme, begin to completely shut down. Okay, so GI distress is most likely to occur during endurance events. And that is simply because of the duration. Okay, a lot of times you can get away with stuff when it's a shorter duration exercise, but once you start getting to that endurance point, it's just harder to hide from any mistakes that you make with eating and drinking. You can read through what some of the problems can be. You probably experience this. The food moves too quickly through you when you have diarrhea, or um, you can have cramping, 
something like that. Symptoms tend to be more common in women than men um, as exercise physiologists. We're not quite sure why. Um, maybe it's something that has to do with hormones. There's a different hormone balance with women. Doesn't mean that women are weaklings, but uh, just if you run the stats about GI distress, women tend to complain of it more than men. Causes of the stress could be physiological. So remember I said, when we're exercising, we redirect blood flow away from the digestive tract to the skeletal muscles. And that's by design. That's how it should be. But if you've overloaded your digestive tract, then when energy goes away from your GI tract to your muscles, and you've got a lot of food sitting on the digestive tract, it's probably going to lead to negative side effects. There can simply be a mechanical cause. Think about an endurance runner. Think about running, which is something that is weight-bearing and very jarring to the body. You get that jostling effect where whatever it is sitting in your GI tract, from all that repetitive bouncing, uh, it can become very uncomfortable. Um, there are certain things with what we eat that can cause GI distress. Distress. Uh, if you ingest a lot of fiber or a lot of fats, those are going to be the ones that tend to lead to the most GI distress. If you le if you ing ingest sports drinks that are too highly concentrated or too high of osmolarity, you're more likely to have GI distress. But on the other hand, if you don't have enough food or drink, you could also suffer from some GI distress. The last point I want to make here before we go to the last slide, this is very individual. Even though as scientists we do our best to study and try and find some universal truths, it's very individual. Some people can eat whatever they want and be just fine. Now, does that mean that they're going to maximize their performance? Probably not. But while other people just tend to be a little bit more sensitive in their digestive tract, the best way to do it is trial and error. Uh, so as we go through this semester, I'll give you plenty of ideas, but the best thing in terms of you is just trial and error to find what works best for you. Okay, I will leave you with a quote from a former New York City and Boston Marathon winner. Look at his finishing time in 1979. Whew, whole marathon, two hours and nine minutes. That's a per minute mile pace of under five minutes. Bill Rogers said more marathons are, are won or lost in the porta potties than at the dinner table. <laughs> so especially when you get to high level competition, nutrition becomes even more important. All right, we'll pick up this, these things more later. Uh, but for now, that's it, folks.